All righty, and uh, welcome to this evening's Bird Dog Chat with Ethan and Cat. We are back for another one. Let's see, as everybody's kind of tuning in here, some check-ins. I threw a little comment in there. I think, folks, everything is rocking and rolling. We're actually on time slash went live a minute early. I, uh, I'm i giving all the credit to uh, Charlie in the background there, so... Definitely not me. He was like, click the live button already. Yep. <laughs> so, um, if you were looking at this evening's title, you may be going, huh, sounds like a little bit of uh, a rinse and repeat from an EV earlier uh, chit-chat. And it's it kind of involves a little bit of that, but this story is going to be a little bit more fun because it involves this lady. Yeah. I got to go grouse hunting this time. Uh-huh. It was a lot of fun. We had a great trip. Um, let's look at the check-ins here. Who do we got? Dun, 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 dun. There it is. Todd from Wisconsin. You can... I made it just a little too big, didn't I? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or, or I could make this. Maybe can I make that just a little? Nope. Make it just a little, just a, just a wee bit. There you go. Okay. We've got Todd from Wisconsin and Kevin from Piedmont, South Dakota. Hey, Miss Kelly, Mac, and GSP Jackson from New Jersey. Western Colorado from, where did that go? Ashley, Southeast Alabama checking in. Hello from Colorado. Hey, Tina. Hey, Kaylin from Alberta, Canada. Nate from Penn Argyle, Pennsylvania. We got Northern Indiana, Australia. Whoop, whoop. Our first international. Oh, no. Second international check-in because Canada counts. Canada counts. Brian and Benny checking in from Wisconsin. Hey, Brian. Uh, it keeps bopping. Smir Smyrna, Tennessee. New York in the house. That's Smirnoff? No, not quite. Oh. Car uh, Carlos, Minnesota. We've got uh, New Jersey, Wisconsin, South Carolina, Oak Grove, South Oak Grove, Mon Montana, yeah, South Georgia, New Jersey, Minnesota, Quebec, Canada. M M O. Are we just going to glance over the fact that you called M O Montana? Wait, what is that? Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. We were Good. just going to glance over it, but yep. that um, kind of defeated my thanks. Honey. Everybody I'm heard it. <laughs> I'm just pointing out the You're obvious because there's no one out. here to poke you but me. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, those stupid abbreviations, they get me every time. Yeah, if only we'd learned those in like <laughs> grade school. Yeah, and something. how long ago has that been for you and me? A very A long time. A little minute. Do you remember from... A little the minute. The construction. Yeah. It'll just be a little minute. It'll just be a little minute. If y'all can sit tight here, uh, it'll just be a little minute, and we'll <laughs> have this out of the way so you can drive on through. And 30 minutes later, we're still waiting on the construction. We're still uh, waiting on road that Road construction. <laughs> yep. We've got California. Hey, Jason. How are you guys? Uh, da, 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 da. Bounce. Bop in. Yeah. You keep bouncing. There you know you're past. Yep. I'm past it. Oh, yeah, there's my uh, Missouri mess up again. Okay, mm. we got North Carolina, Central Wisconsin, Manhattan, Kansas. Kansas in the house. Ooh, ooh. East Canton, Ohio, Minnesota, Chuck, Chuck, another Jay Minnesota, Hawk. Michigan, whoop, whoop, Ontario, Canada. We've got Missouri. <laughs> yeah. uh, Wisconsin is showing up, yeah. And Oklahoma. And then more Northeast Kansas. There we go. Absolutely. Um, as always, I like to start off with a couple things. First and foremost, I want to say thank you to patrons, the largest sponsor of everything that we do online. If you are a patron, thank you. If you are not a patron and considering there are a couple different options, this bopped up here, you've got, um, a few different tiers to break down what Patreon is. You have, uh, it's your, your self help, your key to the self help world, essentially, um, now, there's a couple cool new things. So we are 
pushing a, a shift, but it kind of depends on what type of action you're looking for. On Patreon specific, you have tiers. There's just a thank you. It's $5 for a, a, a month. That gets you access to play Bird Dog Bingo, which we're playing tonight. There's a link if you find it there. That's the same bad mamma jamma of a link. It'll generate you a card, and you can play this evening for... Um, a chance to win the Final Rise Sidekick Bird Vest ooh, system. Ooh, 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 ooh. We should grab that and show that off here in a second if you don't know what that is. I think it's on the table over there, yeah. And the $5 tier, basically, it's like saying thanks. It's a, a tip jar. You don't have to be signed up forever. You could sign up for one month to say thanks. And then you get the opportunity to play every Wednesday night when we do this, too. So um, as you move up, that's when you get into the self-help categories. And the help comes from yours truly. We have the $35 tier, and that gets you Q&A as well as video exchange. You can send us videos to review of your training sessions. Then as we have <laughs> just well tested just to see what it can hold, the um, – Next tier up is what we were calling the step-by-step uh, -step program. And basically, I'm guiding along the path, providing custom training plans for what you're looking for and doing video chats twice a month or four times a month, depending on which tier you're on. Now, the new fancy-schmancy thing that uh, Kat put her blood, sweat, and tears into was actually... The top there on that Patreon link, you were in there. It's the uh, Standing Stone School of Dog Training we launched with the first course. Kat, you can just briefly talk about that. So the first course that we've been able to put out is what you guys had all been asking for forever and ever. And it is basically taking a puppy from eight weeks through a year old, all of the training and all of the processes through that. Now, that training can be applied to an older dog. So if your dog's, you know, 10 weeks old, even four months old, and you're really just getting started, this absolutely can apply. You're just going to start at the beginning and work your way through the training process. Uh, but that's what it was kind of geared for. There is like 40 weeks of training lessons. There's How many hours of content? I, I think there was like 105 it. hours of video. It's If you so scroll sorry, down, it talks, <laughs> it talks about there. all the things that are included. Um in the first course so yeah there it is 40 weeks of training 105 videos with over 20 hours there we go i had i had that back because i said 105 hours yeah you did. 105 Good, videos nice. 20 hours yeah um then we've got samples of our course checklist and we've also got samples of your like weekly schedule that you would be putting together for your puppy more of a routine if you will um and those are on the course, um, every lesson has one. So that's just a quick sample so you can see kind of an overview of week four's training there. But uh, we put a lot of time into it. We're getting great feedback already from people that have already started utilizing the program. Um, and if you are getting a new puppy or are starting training and you kind of need some guidance and, hey, I go from step A to step B all the way through, that would be a great program for you. And then if you have more of a customized need, uh, s more specific like behavioral issues or things that you're struggling with specifically, that's where Patreon can really be beneficial. And you can utilize both. I think we've got a couple patrons that are utilizing both mm -hmm. the program as well as the live um, tiers to help them through some of their training goals and projects. 100%. So um, Patreon is an awesome way to support as well as get help from us. Thanks for everybody that are patrons. Now, uh, moving forward, I want to show that real quick here. Let's I mean do not knock anything over. So, uh, Final Rise is a cool company. Um, if you've seen the Standing Stone podcast, there's actually an episode with Matt and I. We chatted a little bit about uh, this system and specifics. There, you got a whole idea of what it is. This is a um, training belt slash type of thing. You've got birds in the back, you've got water bottle holders, you got shell pouches and or they're vented so you could you could jam a pigeon or two side by side in there. Um, velcro and it's very much adjustable and it even has a nice little lumbar support. Lumbar support in there. Wow, thinking of us old folks. So you've got um, that was a 
was a joke, but it's there. It's really nice. If you're looking for a training vest, this would be absolutely fantastic. That goes to the first bingo. If you have a bingo, call it out. We'll verify. Throw us your card number. We'll verify that if we did or did not say the things or do the things. And then from there, uh, you just shoot us a quick message and we will bingo, bingo. Mail it out to you. Ship you the stuff. Now, we have another announcement, a new puppy. Yeah, we haven't even ooh, officially ooh, announced ooh. him yet on the gram uh-huh. or we, Facebook. So We, we do. We do he is puppy. from our Trix Vex litter. He is super cute. A stud muffin. Yeah, we're mm-hmm. pretty excited for him. And his registered name. I like to get clever with things. Uh, Ethan. Clever girl. Not so much. <laughs> he just either approves or denies my ideas, basically. In case you didn't catch that, that was a video reference. Cat didn't catch it. so No, it was probably from some movies. funny movie. It wasn't, actually. You've seen the movie. What was it? What was the... Say it again. Say it again. Uh, clever girl. That's not a movie reference. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Name that movie, folks. <laughs> the new puppy's name is Standing Stones Double Trouble. Uh, anyone else having trouble with the bingo card? Um, uh, let me know if you are. I think I saw there were quite a few people that already had cards. Right now, there's a bunch of cards rocking and rolling. Try the link again, Angelo, from Patreon. Um, I can't copy and paste that. I can. No, you can't. Let me try this. But anyway, so we we kept Cadabra from that litter. We had a fun little litter theme name with magic because Trix's name is Trouble in Disguise. You know, kind of disguise magic. You know, mystic. Type of stuff. So we mm-hmm. he was Cadabra. There was Abra and Cadabra, the two liver males in that litter, which was really hard to choose between them. Um, it's from Jurassic Park. Yes, you watched the movie. I have seen the movie, but I don't like sit there and study it so that I can do it, movie references. Uh, it's just on like every T-shirt that says Jurassic Park ever. Um, I also but don't the have one of those. Okay. Uh, um. The this was painful watching. Um, him use the clicker on the Velociraptors going click, 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 be like, that's not how a clicker works. Not exactly. Stop. Group training the Raptors. Yeah. But yeah, we kept Kadabra and he, yep. Oh, there he is. Um, so he is now lovingly referred to as Hex and it was kind of cool. If you look up Hex and synonyms for Hex, abracadabra comes up so it was very clever that it worked out that way plus you know rolling with the trouble theme with double trouble because tricks mama was or tricks her name is trouble in disguise and then vex is time for trouble so trouble trouble the next down the line the next down the line is gonna have to be standing stones all the triple trouble all the trouble troubled (laughs) <laughs> could just be troubled. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, but so that was a fun one to come up with. And uh, he's another one of the X-Men because we've got Rex, Nix, Vex, and now Hex. So X-Men. But it was also really <laughs> cool. It was horrible if clicker work. Yeah. It was very horrible clicker work. Oh, um, if painful. you have followed along with some of our dogs, you may know that Hex is actually the sixth generation again, which Legacy was the sixth generation, the first sixth generation that we'd kept out of a program. And so we've got Rex, Nix, Vex, Quest, Trix, Hex. So kind of cool. It is very cool. I uh, knew y'all were asking <laughs> in your head, so I'm just showing. Show and tell. Show and tell. Elmer T. Lee. The so Sour Mash. We original. also typically answer people's questions, but those happen at the end. So if you guys are diehard Live stream followers, you know, we get to these questions. We do them at the end, especially if you throw up a super chat. We're going to give those preference. But we typically talk about whatever the topic is that we're planning on that evening for a little bit. Do some announcements like we are. Check-ins, chat with you people. And then move into answering questions. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit more about grouse hunting in South Dakota. Because I got to go this time. And it was really cool and completely different than pheasant hunting. 
it's it's fun. Okay, so going on the hunting trips I- is different. Before I would get to tell stories and reminisce and joke and com- camaraderie with the people that I went hunting with and that kind of thing. Um, it's really interesting being a dad and having a boy who pays attention and cares and um, is very interested in what is happening. And he got a uh, hunting trip stories one day at a time for bedtime stories. And he was like, that's uh, what tonight, he requested. Day two, dad, tell me the day two story. And then day three, what did you do on day three? So yeah. Uh, it was very cool. It was uh, to be able. It's very cool to be able to do that and to share it with him. And the fact that he wants to hear about it, it's it's really fun. So, hundred percent. But we went up there, and the first day, it kind of was misty and rainy for a little while that morning. So birds were doing different things than um, they had been typically for you when you were up there, basically opening weekend in September. Mm-hmm. So we had to wait. Uh, quite a while until things were really drying out because the birds were not where we thought they would be based on cover and not wanting to be wet and things. So um, once that kind of dried up, then we got into some birds um, in one specific spot. We really got into some. Yeah, and I mean, that's not that abnormal for stuff, but that place we had hunted the year before, and it was pretty good. I mean, birds fairly consistency consistently in a lot of areas, um, but primarily in the area that we found birds is where we found birds the year before. Um, now, the big difference was that area specifically was drier and had been fairly heavily grazed, um, and that adds some trouble to our cause in a sense of not having tall enough cover for the birds to stay in if they even wanted to be there at all. Now, big shift was when we were there originally. Oh, yeah, that's a cool picture. Where's that? Is that one of DT's From pictures? From DT's pictures, yeah. Yep. Which day does he say that is or did he? That looks like day first two. Four yeah, first four-mile loop down was uh, the um, third day when he posted that. Oh, okay. Because mm-hmm. um, we didn't even walk four miles in the second day. Yes, we did. Oh, maybe hours. I'm thinking hours. Yeah, hours. We walked four hours. We didn't even walk four hours. No, we walked like three hours. That and was it. My phone kept grumping at me. It was like, are you going to record this exercise? Outdoor walk? Yeah, this outdoor walk. I'm like, sure, why not? It's like, current pace, 27 minutes per mile. I'm walking really slow. Yeah, but so there was a lot of hills, so. Yeah, but the cover had changed. Okay, so we didn't hunt there earlier. We'd gone to some different places, and big difference was they were hitting more alfalfa for bugs and the grass for bugs. And this, we primarily found all of our birds on this second trip, which is first part of October, with a little bit of weather change, some little bit of rainier stuff, and a cold snap coming that uh, we found everything near or had recently been in, pretty much in, some form of feed field. Sunflowers, corn, we found some milo, and then like a millet cover crop feed type of something, something. I have no, I have no bingo. What's the, the bingo cards are on Patreon. There is a link, and you just click that and it should populate one for you. Let me know still if you can't if you can't get it. Just go to the the wall on on Patreon there. But um, so differences from what we were at before. So it's interesting to do. But the rainy weather makes it kind of tough. They stay out of. They were just sitting in the middle of this recently cut alfalfa field, and we found them like. I don't know, 50 plus. Oh, there were so many. And those were the first ones we really saw. And it was like, whoa, but they were all too far away. They were really It was really cool, though. Busted wild. Flew everywhere. And um, I I attribute a big part of that to that specific area just not really having cover. So they had kind of grouped up by their only option. But then um, we did get into... um, Was that from the... That was from day two. I'm going to send it to Charles. No, you just plug your phone in. And then oh, you I can do that? Yep. In this thingy? Yeah. 
Oh, this is technology. I so love it. Cat has some stuff that you ask me. Ahead of, do you have specific things you want to share? Nope. But Cat, Cat does because Cat's I, the one about. I mean, taking and I shirt. honestly have some on here too. I'll I'll find them. But so a little bit different on that first day. We did get into some birds, but it was um, by complete luck almost because we yeah, were walking luck on timing 100 percent. Yeah, yeah because we were walking right area wrong time where up this knoll up this little hill with really butched cover like we were talking about and the birds just randomly flew in over us yeah, and we then sat down on the other side of the knoll i mean we're like 10 15 minutes from ending and moving on and here come this giant group of birds and land in the grass and then we were able to work a few of those, and they kind of flushed back over the hill and landed, and then we were able to go work those once they had scattered out a little bit and did pretty well with that. I mean, we, we killed a few. Um, a good first day, considering half the day was raining. Yeah, basically. definitely. So. And then day two was day two was awesome because I didn't actually get a grouse my first day. Um just was not in the right place at the right time. Like, literally all the birds got up by Ethan or all of them got up by Brian. And I, I got, like, one legit opportunity and I missed. So, and I'm blaming it on my new gun because Ethan got me a new gun. And it was literally the first time I'd been shooting it. And so, I was working out the kinks, you know. It's exactly <laughs> like your old gun, but just a, a little different. It, it had literally never been shot. That was the first round through. You could have went pop, 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 and then but it it was the it up. has the kickoff, so I wasn't used to the kickoff. Okay, I'm just kidding. I missed. I blatantly missed. But I'm trying to make excuses, and you're not letting me. So thanks for that, yeah, honey. Yeah, one one hundred percent. I understand the ex- the excuse of the gun. Mm-hmm. So then day two, we uh, actually got on some public land because. Um, the place that we were going to go that was private, they had got a little more moisture and the roads weren't going to be great, pulling a trailer and a big heavy truck. So we were like, well, let's not go tear up their field, their pasture, things like that, their roads. So we went and found some public land using Onyx maps. Ethan was able to look at some opportunities and go, well, the terrain looks really good here. There's some uh, crops like we were talking about. There's some alfalfa. This should really close this should look good now it's just a matter of getting eyes on and seeing if it's been overgrazed or anything like that and so we drove up there and stepped out and we're like this looks really good so let's give it a walk and that's where we walked and then I I had the misunderstanding that the birds were going to be on the top of these hills I they thought that that was the explanation that I got. They're going to be all on the top of these hills. And I was like, oh, my gosh, these on, are a lot of hills. On average, they were near the top of the hills, on average. But the ones that we started finding were in just, like, this little bit of thicker, brushier cover on the side hill towards, like, a little valley thing. And, and on the side hill, yeah. Yep, and that's where we saw a lot of the snowberries and rose hips. Yeah, which... Brian uh, kept calling them snow peas the whole time. Snow peas, yeah. Snow peas. We've got all the snow peas. It's like Brian berries, um, which is interesting enough. They're com- they're called, I believe, common snowberries, which they're toxic to people. Because when I was cleaning birds, crops are full of these berries, and it smell. It actually smelled really good. It reminded me a lot of the mash of rose hips and snowberries together in the crop, which started fermenting a little bit smelled a lot like cider like s- that you would drink in the fall. It was very weird because it smelled good. It was there was no like eh to it. It was very good smelling. So but eh, if you want to look at this picture. So this was one of the birds that we got out. There was all these grasshoppers in the crop of this bird. Um just they'd been in the alfalfa and were eating bugs and I Again, was like, holy cow, that's really crazy to see. So I snapped a picture of it because literally there's there whole grasshoppers in this bird. So it was pretty cool. And we did get some other pictures of some of the other crops. I don't know if you have them on your phone that had the I do. rose hips and mm-hmm. the right snowberries, fine. which was really cool. Because so they're all just like. whole and it looks really neat. We'll see if Ethan can pull up one. Um, Would have been right when we got back. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's some. This one's got a good variety of all of it. Click on that, and you plug it into the plugger inner thing. Dun dun da da. What would be the easiest way for me to pull up Onyx Maps on here? To sh- like show, well, on the computer it would be easier to show. What's that? On ah. his. But um, did you plug it in? Okay, yeah. there we go. Yeah, yeah. So that is um, you see the red. That's a rose hip. And those are edible for people. There's like rose hip jam and some different stuff that you could. I looked that up on the internet. The little green is some form of leafy stuff. Probably where we got these birds, it was probably alfalfa leaves because they were right on the edge of this draw that was alfalfa to a drop off. And then this whole little draw loop was just full of berries. And the snowberries are the little white ish kind of green ones. And then this bird was also picking off the hopper. So it was like, Grouse 101, this is what you're looking for in South Dakota in that area, 100%. But it was really cool to me to see all the pieces kind of come together, and I actually shot two sage uh, sharp tail that day, didn't mm-hmm. I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the next day I got one. So it was cool. I, you know, got to check that bird off my bucket list. So, um, and you got two prairie chickens while we were up there. I did. I shot a prairie chicken on the second day, and I shot a prairie chicken on the third day, and I shot a prairie chicken on the first day. You kind of uh, went. You did on first the day and second. First day. day and second day. You're right. Yeah. I did not on the third day. Okay. Okay. Sorry. But it was still really cool. Really cool birds to to get an opportunity to hunt, and I am kind of hooked. I am not giving up pheasant hunting in the slightest because I still really like that. But this was definitely different type of hunting and a different experience. And it was fun to, we'd be driving and I'm like, Ooh, that looks grousy. That looks like, that looks like a grousy area. I was trying to like, Hey, we've got the alfalfa. We've got this, we've got the cover. We've got the little Hills. I'm like, look, it looks grousy. Let's check it. Is it, is it public land? Can we go out there? So it was kind of fun to put all the pieces together and start knowing what you're looking for and knowing where you'd want to be hunting it. Let me see. That's what I could, saying. but the the only thing about that is it won't show the 3D map as well as I would like to to be able to cuz you can't Mm-mm. What's up? On here? No. No. Um <laughs> the only other thing that I can do is I can I can screen share on here, but it would probably screw with audio. No, I wouldn't screw with audio. Yeah. All right. I will add that real quick while you're doing this. So let me pull it up. Well, we're so doing what? Um, I'm gonna add Onyx Maps. I'm gonna pull that up real quick here so that we can. I can kind of show properties. To look at, like how to do that just a little bit. And well, while you're looking at that, then I'll I'll talk a little bit about the third day. So we hunted um, very similar area the third day, and uh, only got into a few grouse. And then we were like, well, let's go look somewhere else. And we went to a place where we're like, well, let's. This looks okay. This looks it's a little bit different than what we've been hunting, but it still looks like it's got all the pieces. So let's go hunt this and. We did, and it was a pretty big walk, um, and there was less hills for sure, but uh, the coolest part of that entire walk was we're walking, and Doc, one of our young puppies, locks up on point, and there goes a sharp tail, and I think you shot it, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was really cool. it flew right at me. Yeah, well, and that was the thing. It threw, flew straight at Ethan, and he yells, shoot it, and I'm like... I love you too much for that, honey. Um, and then it flew between him and Brian, but out. And so he was able to shoot at it. But I was like, I had no shot. I was like, either straight at Ethan or straight at Brian. And I'm like, not worth it. Even if he tells me to shoot it. So. All right. Is it screen sharing yet? Or are you no, doing your yet. thing? Nope. So some other fun things in... Um, 
some other fun things that let's see here that happened in that third day that were interesting. So we uh, we picked a spot. I'm gonna kind of show you how we went about that, and then um, we end up finding birds right where I kind of expected to find them, but uh, and then uh, finished with Doc found that in the beginning of the walk. Then Shock was hunting in front of me, and she pointed a pheasant. Because we, we changed covers, and I was like, this doesn't seem like cover anymore, but we got to get to the other side. And she pointed a pheasant in there, and it was a rooster. <laughs> and it was tough. Like, it was instinct. Like, oh, ah, it's a rooster. Right? We're not pheasant We're not hunting pheasant right now. Yet. And then um, worked all the way across the other side, and she ends up pointing a grouse at the end. And, and or a porcupine. Yeah. So she locks up on point. I walk about five, six feet ahead of her, and there is a giant porcupine. And about three, four feet in front of that, a sharp tail gets up. And you so, shot that. And then I shot the sharp tail. So uh, luckily for that, because she took off after the sharp tail that was cut off over the side, and then I w- was able to get away from the porcupine. So she didn't end up getting it. Whether she was smelling porcupine or not, I don't have any idea. She's she been into solid. porcupines before, so hopefully... Yeah, she got in one la- last year. Last year, year yeah. <laughs> Puppy shot. Goofy. Let's see. I think I can add just this window here. Give me just one second. working should be okay well maybe we can't mess with it um yeah i think we're live again sorry about that it uh got angry it was too many things it said do not show that so i i could i just won't have my audio we'll do it another night we'll spend a um we'll do another evening We've specifically talked about talking about that. it yeah. yeah we'll do another one um it's something that i want to put a lot more emphasis on and uh, what's cat drinking? There's a question. Um, it's something I want to put a lot more emphasis on for folks, which is more about how to hunt. Um, stopping in the middle of things, right, and showing this is where we found birds and this is what happened and so on and so forth. So it's it's because um, I get the question all the time. It's like, wh- how, where, what, right? You know, it's. And I learned a lot from this trip. Because I'd never hunted, you know, sharp tails or any grouse, really. I'm We'd gone out on one Montana trip with Aiden, and it was not a normal hunting trip. And we were on some BLM land and things like that. Mm-hmm. And so We're in Montana. Yeah. And so, but I didn't shoot anything. There was one grouse shot that entire trip by you, and that was it. <laughs> so, um, that's hunting for you. But uh, anyway, so I learned a lot. Which I did shoot that grouse with Aiden on my back and Thunder retrieved it, which yeah. was pretty Cause cool. Because he was like a five-month-old little pup-pup at that time. Aiden was pumped, too. Yeah. Like, nice shot, Dad. Yeah. He, like, he likes going along and hunting, so. He does. 100%. Well so, I'm it was uh, it was a really cool trip. And I'm definitely going back, so he, he can't leave me at home anymore. And uh, I got to ask, too, like, why isn't Vex, uh, Charles asked me that. He said, why didn't Vex go? I said, because I would run him. And this was a, tri- a trip for the puppies. So. They had to learn a lot. Yeah, it was a big, big we ran opportunity the for them. I mean, yeah. and I say puppies, they're all right around a year. This is like their first season. Like, get this after This is what we had talked about girls. in another episode, you know, Sometimes we have really young dogs like Thunder, based on when he was born, rolling into his first hunting season at, like, five months old, six months old. And then you've got some puppies that are born October, November time frame, so they're not going to be rolling into their first hunting season until they're coming up on a year. And so um, they have to learn a lot, just like the five, six-month-old puppies had to learn a lot. And you want to be like, oh, they're behind. Well, no, they just haven't had any hunting opportunities like the other dogs did, so... This was their opportunity to gain some of that experience on wild birds, um, figure them out, start pointing them, doing some retrieves, learning how to hunt out there. So it was really good for them, too. But 
Let's uh, roll into answering some questions. How does that sound? That sounds good to me. I was trying to see what this would actually look like. But it doesn't work quite the same just because of the fact that uh, I just wouldn't be able to, I like, I'd have to, f we'd have to jank with audio so that I could talk through it while I was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all right. We'll do another, we'll do another uh, evening just about that. Make sure that we're set up for it so that we don't crash OBS. So I'm trying to find a question. Nobody's been asking questions so far tonight. Listening tonight. Yeah. You have a GSP puppy coming your way on the 25th. That's uh, Michelle Landry. Highly recommend our online dog training step-by-step -step course that you can find on uh, our website. Yeah, StandingStoneSupply.com. Sorry. Yep, it'll literally go through eight weeks through a year old of training program. Step-by-step um, -step lessons. What's <laughs> catching? It looks like water to me. I was drinking a gin and tonic. Charles made it for me. It's okay. Wait, wait, wait. Still was tasty. Looks like water to me. Yeah, no. Do you get... Here you go. So how many dogs did you take and which ones on the trip, right? I, I didn't see any other questions mm -mm. previous to that. Okay. We took on this trip eight. Except yes. the trailer. Yep, Nobody just the, the trailer. trailer. Mm -hmm. Yep. So eight in the trailer, and it was uh, Legacy, yep. Doc, Clay, mm -hmm. and then we had Shock, Splash, Oscar, Deacon, and one more Tricks. Tricks, yeah, Mama Tricks. She was just finishing up pup pups, so she, she did got surprisingly to well for. And she was um, one just of the coming off of. You yeah, know. so between her, Splash, Oscar, and Deacon, those were our seasoned dogs, if you will. And technically puppy shock, but... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but she was, six she was months old. really young when she was up there in South Dakota last time, so... Um, and she did get into a porcupine her first year, too, so... Mm -hmm. The last day of the last hunt. Yes. Oh, keep I, I rolled my eyes at myself. Is that on the card? No. So this is a question from L. Setterstrom. Hi, guys. Love your videos. Question about e-collar DT systems. Eight-month poodle pointer tried introducing her about six, week go sweet six weeks ago. Vibrate made mode only, and she just shut down. Suggestions. So this is something that um, we've worked with people on before where, you know, they are starting collar conditioning and introducing the collar and... Um, the puppy might have a little bit of an adverse reaction to it just because they're unsure and don't know what's happening and then you don't know what to do. So your response to them kind of being weird is to turn the collar off and then they learn, oh, well that worked. That's all I had to do was kind of hunker down or scratch my neck or kind of freeze or hide under the table and then the collar shuts off, which is not what you're trying to do. You're trying to maybe teach them to recall. So it's important that the collar shuts off when they've completed what you're asking. So set yourself up for success, tether your dog so that you can, you know, help reel them into you a little bit, get them out from under, you know, tables or chairs or things that they're trying to hide under, uh, help them stay in the vicinity of the training session, keep the momentum, keep their feet moving. So um, definitely revisiting it in a more controlled situation with a check cord or a tether would be very beneficial. Uh, but this is something we help tons of people on Patreon with all the time is doing the collar conditioning process. They're either not confident knowing what to do or how to go about doing it, or they've maybe made a mistake and their puppy is acting kind of like what yours is. And we're able to help them work through that and solidify collar conditioning for them. That said, do you guys run into any young pheasants? Did you guys? Uh-huh. Um, and the answer to that is, uh, is no. We were primarily not in pheasant habitat. So we've, we walked through a couple very small patches of quote unquote pheasant habitat and we moved a couple pheasants, but um, we really were not in prime pheasant habitat. So and if you are finding a bunch of pheasants, you're probably not in prime sharp tail prairie chicken habitat. No. 
the super chat. I'll bop down to get that one, and then we can come back to some other ones. So Ryan Jones said, I have a wire hair pointing Griffon, and after upland hunting, putting her through duck hunting. I want to make her as versatile as possible. What steps would you take? Um, so have you done any exposure to waterfall hunting so far, or have you only prepped for the upland hunting side of things? Um, you know, a bird and a gun introduction are going to be valuable for both as far as um, making sure that they don't have any sensitivities to those things, but also having a solid, you know, recall, but with waterfall hunting, typically also solid place training is really important from a steadiness side of things. Um, and then just exposure to water retrieves and bigger bird retrieves. Some of those ducks can get really big. Some of the geese can get really big, um, compared to, you know, quail or chucker or pheasant even, so doing things like that, working through some steadiness sequences or tethering your dog and making sure they're comfortable with that, making um, something that is uh, overlooked, I think, a lot is dogs that have never been actually waterfall hunting, whether that's, you know, at a duck blind, a goose blind, whatever, is figuring out how to work a decoy spread because all those decoys can be very distracting and confusing to a dog. So helping them practice making retrieves through the decoys is, is really important. Um, we got a call for a bingo on this one here. It says uh, drinking beer or gin. We got gin there. Super chat, free space, subscribe request. I, I don't, don't believe we that did. we have asked anybody to subscribe. Unless they're, Referring to joining, joining Patreon. Patreon. Uh, and that's not really subscribing. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I, I mean. It's a gray area. Uh, What's up? It is subscription-based. It okay. is subscription-based. So subscribe. Okay. Subscribe, folks. Please subscribe. No, there. there's Finalize no there's no doubt. No question. <sighs> Subscribe to everything. Dun, dun, dun. There were a couple other people that were really, really That's close. what I was asking over water only. Ah, uh, yeah. Nope. Yeah, 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 yeah. I started yeah, yeah. out that way, Con and then Charles just handed me a drink, and I couldn't resist. So Con there it is. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> go ahead and shoot us a message with your info, Nate, and we will get this bad boy shipped out to you. <laughs> Bingo, maybe. <laughs> Bingo, maybe. No, um, he, we, we knew it was on the edge. Uh, Mark H. said, any tips on your approach training more sensitive natural breed, uh, sensitive natured breeds like a wire hair pointing Griffon 11 months, specifically anything around being gun shy, my fault on introduction incorrectly. So um, first of all, we work with lots of dogs that are quote unquote more of a sensitive nature compared to a short hair. Typically, short hairs are considered pretty bold, confident, uh, mentally stable, ready to go, ready to mature quickly and work. Um, we've worked with Vishlas, we've worked with Weimariners, we've worked with Brock Francais, um, some wire hair pointing Griffons that I would consider a little more sensitive than others, but not all. Um, and we just take every dog, no matter the breed, no matter the uh, stereotype or generalization of, oh, they're a sensitive breed. And we just apply the amount of pressure that's necessary in any training situation. So we're never unfair to the dog. Um, our goal is to help them succeed. And so we train them accordingly. Now talking about gun sensitivity and gun shyness. Uh, one, one thing before you move on there, yeah, yeah. I think that on average, well, y in your specific situation, you're saying you're having issues with gun sensitivity. Uh, sure, that kind of bodes toward maybe an improper introduction or a dog that has a predisposition to being more sensitive. But uh, personal opinion is that, like Kat said, using the least amount of pressure for any given training situation or whatever it may be. But those dogs often attempt to play you a little bit too. So I try and take the approach of fair and realistic expectations. So it's I think that on average, the soft, quote unquote, softer uh, dogs or breeds or, or what have you do a pretty good job playing that up and kind of weaseling in how to get away with things and um, holding, again, fair and realistic expectations is also really important. So go ahead. So the gun sensitivity thing. So that's definitely something that has to be handled on a dog by dog basis and 
every dog is different. Every approach is different. Every process is different. Every length of time to get over it is different. Um, and we've worked with lots of different breeds that have had gun sensitivity from wire hairs to Griffons to short hairs to Brock Francais to Brocco Italianos and um, to, did I say short hairs? I think I did. Uh, to Vishla. So all of them have needed uh, different approaches and different amounts of time to get over that sensitivity. And that's definitely something that because it has to be taken on a one-on-one -on -one individual basis, I can't make a whole bunch of generalizations here explaining how to go about that process. But the gist of it is you have to find something that your dog is more driven for that pulls their focus to any of the noise sensitivity stuff, the gunfire. Um, and you have to get away from them anticipating the opportunity for gunfire in any situation. So you remove gunfire completely from the training until you see that bold confidence and excitement about something. Typically for our bird dogs, we're working with birds to get over that. Um, some dogs are retrieve driven enough. Some dogs are food motivated enough that you could utilize those things. But typically they're not the, the go-tos for, for us with the bird dogs. I would say on average, the biggest thing to keep in mind moving in the direction of what you explained is that gunfire will not fix gun sensitive or gun shy dogs. Absolutely. And I, I believe that the average thought process or approach is we need to do more of this to get them used to it. And the fact of the matter is the dog's brain doesn't 100% seem to work that way. It's I'm scared of this, and the more you do it, the more it's going to compound the problem. So, um, like Kat mentioned, the goal is that no attention is paid to the gunfire until you can actually build a good association with it, and then attention will be paid to gunfire, meaning birds are coming down or, or getting up or something. So, depends on who you're hunting with. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm trying to scroll up and see if there were some more questions. Let's see if you see one. Oh, Ethan, <laughs> squinting. Always can't see worth a darn. Ooh, 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 ooh. Um, I saw there, 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 there. It says this one. Uh, yeah. It says, tips for getting the dog to break into thorny cover, roses and raspberries. It's a very interesting question. Uh, and what I would say is take off your pants and walk into that <laughs> raspberry bush. Now, I, I, I've Even seen it firsthand, though. It's, it's a struggle, boss. I mean, it's one, if they have any kind of vest on, they get caught. They get stuck there. They get wrapped up in it because it's viney and it's thorny. But I do know that's where a good portion of your birds are going to be, especially if you guys, like you guys are rough grouse hunting. They like berries too. The grouse in general like berries. So um, it can be part of it, but I don't really believe that they need to get into those. Um, or you're going to end up with, honestly, you'll end up with a lot of cuts, a lot of scratches, and a lot of um, even potential broke off thorns and whatever else to become small infections or foreign body infections. Now, granted, if a bird dropped in there, they'd pro he'd, he'd probably bust in. I, You know, you've got a wild man there. But uh, I wouldn't... Just breaking through that cover to go hunt. It's, it's a tough it's expectation. A, yeah. yeah. Um, I know from experience when I've been just at hunt tests and things like that, that they are in blackberries and things like that. I absolutely hate hunting in that because it does. It just snags on all your clothes. And then even when you're wearing, you know, thicker pants, it's like they still have a way to get through and and scratch you up. So um, I can imagine the dogs feel very similarly. Mm. Um, will you be heading to South Dakota opening weekend? Enjoyed the live IG videos last year, heading out in three weeks. Not yeah. opening weekend. I will be up there the week 18th, after 19th. Yeah. yeah. So I'm um, up for a few days there to, to check out a new property. And then we'll be back the end of the month, like the 28th, 29th, 30th. And then um, into November. 
into November, middle of the month, approximately. Good question. How many Good dogs? Luck on your trip. Oh, okay. Douglas Wood said, "How many dogs will you hunt simultaneously?" Uh, typically three. There was on w- average. There was, I think, one field that we ran four at a time when we were up there in South Dakota. I handled two. Ethan handled two, um, but typically it's three on the yeah, ground one, at a time. One transmitter. It's uh, it would be what I typically do. Yeah. It says, how do you handle the dusty roads and dogs in the trailer? Usually my duck bed, uh, truck bed, excuse me, under the top are just filled, no matter wh- how I seal it. Um, you got to buy an Ainley, and then no dust gets in them. That's <laughs> just how they're designed. Uh, no, I mean, it's just part of it. I think, I don't know that there's anything you can really do, because the exhaust fans that they put in that are designed to pull air out, so it would actually be pulling the dust through the trailer. Um, you know, the guys I was hunting with on the trip up said, this is a nice new trailer. We should do a point of view version of Ethan riding in the trailer to see what your dogs are experiencing. So that sounds like a great idea. Who's driving, you know, like, uh, uh, but it, it would be kind of an interesting view and I bet we could accomplish the same thing, less fun, but the same thing with, uh, GoPro. Ryan Jones said, no exposure to waterfall hunting. So I, w- yet, I would put some emphasis and time into that before just taking him to the blind. Um, oh, yeah. So um, Train like you hunt so you don't have to train while you hunt. Uh-oh. Oh. We got the tinder hots in here. Really? You're in timeout, tinder hots. Goodbye. You, no, not just in timeout. I deleted the one and oh. I put them so they, I mean, okay. a few minutes That's left. Fine. So. Um, there was. Uh, Nate, yeah, just in, in Patreon is perfect. You can shoot me a message there or send an email, whatever works better for you. Uh, Matthew Ratterman, I am a relatively new hunter. I would like to get into upland bird hunting. Do you have any recommended information I should read to help me be more prepared or understand how hunting with a dog works? Uh, That's great. That's the kind of questions we're getting on a regular basis, and we are going to be shooting more uh, how-to videos in all of those respects, breaking down what the process looks like, how to work dogs, how to work fields, how to manage the wind, how to find cover, how to find spots. All of it. It's uh, essentially be called um, a virtual mentor is what we're going to try and be creating over the next year. We'll get a handful of things put out this year, but we're going to miss kind of this early season stuff, and we'll be moving right into some pheasant hunting and going to do our best to cover different states. Um, It just kind of depends a little bit on what opportunities arise, but I like it. The the big things that I would say – as far as books, I, I don't honestly know. Um, mentorship is huge, and trying to find one of your local chapters, if you do, either AKC or NAVDA, will have, um, should have a chapter that's in a reasonable distance of you that you may be able to meet up with somebody that knows what they're doing. And that's going to be the, the biggest thing. I, I mean, it's... You can stumble through stuff, but if you get somebody that shows you just even a handful of things, it's going to make the stumbling a lot easier. So this was a question about from Pedro the Hunter. Quick question. My dog was pointing good at a year old, and now he wants to bomb rush the pigeons. It caught a pigeon once and is bomb rushing now. Do you have suggestions? He's a Portuguese pointer. So um, that can happen, and (laughs) my question for you is, Is he formally woe trained? My wife is half Portuguese and pretty stubborn. Good luck. (laughs) Thanks, Jason. (laughs) Uh, So you added here. Formal woe training would be very beneficial in this situation. Once you've got a dog that understands how to point, and obviously, like you've explained, he already was doing that, and now he's developing some naughty habits of I'm going to try and rush in on it. Um, The other side of it is, are you using electronic launchers? Because that's super beneficial as well. DT Systems has electronic launchers that we use. And 
Um, then when your dog makes a mistake and is going to try and bust in on those birds, you can flush them, launch them, um, and the dog doesn't get the reward of catching them, or and you can stop them from chasing because you're like, man, you didn't do it right. You don't get this one. Um, and with proper timing on the release of those birds, you can really re-harness the um, pointing instinct and then also solidify it by being able to reinforce it with formal woe training. Yeah, they are currently sold out, but the we expectation got an update, is... Yeah. Did you we hear anything other than mid-November? Mid-November. Mid-November, so... For the 505 series, and then the 705 series is... Um, 505 and 509, so 500 series. 700 series is like this... The December, December, probably. December or the first mm -hmm. of the year. Yep, yeah. yep, so... Uh... Do you guys have any experience with grouse hunting with your GSPs? Yes, we talked about that in this live. So go back and listen to the beginning half. Um, uh, I could be referring to a lot of times rough grouse would be considered the primary grouse species because you're going to say sharp, sharp tails, prairie chickens, okay. um, blue grouse specifically, or spruce or whatever. But rough grouse, yes. Um, I have done some. No I'm far for me. from. Far from an expert on this, but um, it does involve a lot of food and then cuttings. So timber cuttings are going to be huge. You want the newer growth into the category of approximately maybe 7 to 10 years range, maybe 5 to 10 years, something like that. Um, but those newer cuttings where stuff's starting to grow back up, those are typically right on the edge of that and then more mature near your, your food sources, which are going to be berries and, and different things of that nature. Um, those are the good opportunities to look for. Again, mentorship is going to be huge. That is a tough game to play. So uh, finding somebody that can help. Uh, and, you know, you can always, I, I'll give you my line right now. If you find somebody that's a, a rough grouse hunter in your area, you could say, Oh, uh, great. Where where do you hunt at? And they say, oh, well, you know, we kind of hunt over there uh, north of whatever on the... Uh, you say, no, 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 specifically, I'd like pens, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they appreciate that every no time. No one does. No. Uh, Tell so me your spots. J, 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 B, 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 B. What is a good number of homing pigeons to own for GSP training? That's a great question. You're um, a pigeon guy, so... If you have one dog... I would say, on average, 10 birds is going to be plenty for a day worth of training, maybe 12. Now, realistically, though, when you're teaching them to home, uh, depending on how far they're going to fly from the training fields to the loft, you should expect to lose approximately 50%. Aha, homing pigeons, all the pigeon videos. Um some, and a lot of those are outdated to do stuff a lot better now, but those are still good information to get you started. Uh, expect to lose about half-ish in the teaching, developing, training process if you're pushing any amount of distance. Um, if you take your time, you shouldn't have too big issues. So. Uh, question from Ryan Jones. Uh -huh. He said, also by subscribing to Patreon, do you have access to different, more videos than you have available on YouTube? Not, Not really. Um, we utilize Patreon more of a direct messaging platform and doing, you know, videos. So we watch your training videos and give you feedback on them as well as uh, you can set up live video consults at the same, you know, time with Ethan or I, and that is where the value is at. W our YouTube channel has all the videos that we've produced um, in a free format. Um, there's, like, I don't even know how many we've got now. 600, some hundreds, hundreds. I'll just throw that out there. I think over 700 videos. Over now. 700 videos now. You're wrong. So um, if you have made it through our entire library of YouTube videos and you still have more questions and need more help, definitely don't know what that was something child related um but patreon would be the place where we can you know one-on-one -on -one help you not just have more video libraries for you so i'm glad the med kit came in handy uh from our standing stone supply kelly with the minor scrapes i'm glad he got into some of the cover for you when he needed to um 
What sort of diet do you feed your dogs? Mine is allergic to preservatives, and I am concerned if she goes hunting and has a weird allergic reaction. Do you recommend anything in terms of this? So we feed Yukonuba premium performance dog food. Um, they have a multiple formulas um, depending on activity levels of the dog. So 2616, 3020, and even the 3028, which we sometimes utilize for some of our dogs during hunting season. But um, we really don't struggle with food allergies with our dogs. Um, allergic reactions obviously can happen, but um, the what I don't know what level or type of allergic reaction you're referring to. I mean, I've seen some dogs that, you know, get a little bit of swelling if they get into a bug bite or something and we utilized Benadryl. But um, other than that, I don't really have an allergic reaction remedy. Uh, do you include a stapler sutures in the med kit? Yes, we do. Quick one there. But as for the food too, so it's interesting. Um, I have seen or heard of dogs having allergic issues um, related to food or related to something that kind of got pinned on food. And I'm not discrediting or saying that you don't have issues from an allergic standpoint to dogs or to dog food, excuse me, or the preservatives. I understand completely that can be a thing, but it may be if it's been a while, um, it may be worth, you know, talking to your vet, making sure that it's a controlled type situation, but um, trying a food again outside, uh, outside of the, the diets that you're specifically on. We've had quite a few dogs that once they're off for a while and they regulate whatever the situation was, they can go back to a uh, probably non-prescription diet and something like what we're feeding, the Yukonuba performance food, and um, have no issues. So that may be worth looking into because what you're going to need from a hunting standpoint is calories. And the average um, prescription diet is not going to have enough for a solid hunting dog. I have not hunted ptarmigan. It's on the list. Is that an invite? I'm just, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> where, where do you hunt? No, exactly. Specifically, pins. your pins. Um, Jacob said, That's what kennels do you numbers. prefer, Gunner or Roughland? Uh, it's, it's, it's probably a really good question to aim at. It's, uh, the, it's this one? Yeah. 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 So it depends on the purpose. So, you know, for in the cab and in our kennel or in our house specifically, we utilize Roughland crates all the time. If I was utilizing a crate in the back of my vehicle, I would absolutely have a gunner back there. Um, we are fortunate enough to have an aluminum dog box in the back of our truck. So we utilize that, and that's from Ainley, uh, just because of the amount of traveling we do with dogs for testing and hunting um, and the amount of dogs that we typically have to travel with. So Yeah, absolutely. But when sometimes, you know, you need a second truck running dogs, you know, back and forth down the field, things like that, we throw gunners in the back. Because we only have one of those aluminum dog boxes in the back of the truck. I am wearing a gunner hat because it fits well, and I don't have a Rufflin Kennels hat. There's that, too. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, you know, really good reasoning for why we use one or the other. Because of your hat. 100%. Okay. You guys, we could answer your questions all night long. We would we would love to, but we have to get a little man, a baby, to bed who's sitting over there patiently waiting for us. So we are going to call it a night. Thank you guys, as always, for tuning in to our live stream. I think we're going to be back next week. No, we are not going to be back next week because Ethan is going to be, like you just said, in South Dakota hunting. Is yeah. That the, is that the day? Yep. Yep. Good thing you have me, honey. Oh but we sense. will be back the week after, so the week of the, the 26th. So October 26th we'll be back. So in and out of hunting season will be a little spotty on the live streams just because, like I said, Ethan will be gone hunting and guiding a bit, and then um, I'm not going to just do it by myself. I wouldn't even know how to set up half of this crap. You just do it with Charlie. Yeah. You do a live chat with Charlie. You hey, maybe we'd do that. Annie and Ooh, I. <laughs> you do an Annie and Cat live chat. Hey. Live chat with Annie and Cat. It works. As long as somebody's doing the chat with me, it always will work because my name is the one that rhymes with chat, <laughs> oh, honey. Oh, you just ruined that for me. All right, everybody. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks for tuning in with us. Uh, we love you, and we will see you next time.